Let's get started. So just picking up where we were last time, I'll just backtrack a little bit. We're studying this problem where we've got some distribution for your mental processes, all this is arbitrary. But it should be kind of forming a proof in your mind. Just working through an example. If I don't know how to prove something, work through an example and see if I can generalize. I think that's the method. So here's our density function. If we want to find the CDF, the probability for the fifth order statistic, so that's the problem we're studying. Fifth order step. And we took n to be six. And so we're basically looking at this distribution right here, picking some number x. And the probability distribution for the fifth order step can be found by considering this new random variable where I'm looking at the number of things that are less than x. And I'm looking for two cases where either six things are less than x or five things are less than x. And so we've either got this case right here where there's five things less than x, or I have six things less than x. If I only had four things less than x, well, the fifth order statistic is not less than x. And that's what we're trying to figure out in the first place, the probability distribution of that. So we're kind of mapping our, our space. We're thinking about the problem differently. Let me just ask a question real quick. I went from something with a variable x to something without x right here. So what should I write to remind ourselves? that there's an x in that equation. So I would probably write this down. Probability z equal to 5, given that I know f of x. So that was the cumulative distribution under this, which we have figured out. And so f of x is just the integral from 0 to x, 1 half x. Yes, if you don't mind the abusive notation. So up my exponent by 1, divide by my new exponent. Just 4 down there between 0 and x. Again, abusive notation. So stuff my calculus teacher told me to knock off, and I just never have. So this is x squared over 4. So I'm conditioning I know that probability when I do this binomial calculation. And so P in the binomial distribution is a function of X. Right there. And so I might write down the notation like that to remind myself. And I'm really finicky with myself about my conditional notation because I always like to know what do I know in the problem. So conditioning is probably the most important thing that we do in statistics. It's how we learn. And so understanding what it all means and making sure you know where your information is when you're doing the analytical calculation is probably important. So I might write down the same thing over here. This would be the probability that z is equal to 6, given that I know what p is, the cumulative distribution, which is a function of x. And we wrote down these two binomial calculations. So these are just IID random draws from a binomial distribution. Five different, or six choose five different ways that I could have chose those five points from six to be the left of x. And I don't care which ones they are. It didn't matter to me. It's exchangeable. And so we compute that CDF, and the CDF is the sum of two terms. Now, Mohammed at the end of the last class, he said, this problem was a little bit easy for you because you picked n is equal to 6 and your order stack to be 5. So there were only two terms. And you followed this example. You know that if I pick n to be 100 and I pick the order stack to be like 80, I have like 20 terms to write down. And so he's like, hey, what gets you made this easy for yourself? And that's true. So 
If I had done the fourth order stat, I would have had three terms appear here. And then when we went to take this derivative, we would have spent a lot of time. So he said, is there a way to write down this CDF that isn't just a sum of a whole bunch of terms? So again, the cumulative for an order stat in general, so fx of i, function of x, is just the sum of a bunch of binomial distributions. I'll write down j f x to the j y minus fx to the n minus j. Where j gets summed from the order statistic of interest in all the bigger terms. Same argument. Um, he said, isn't there a nicer way to write this down where you don't have just this big calculation? I said, I don't think so. I think this is exactly what it is. So this problem right here is isomorphic to this problem right here. There's no way around it. This is this discrete thing, and we're just counting things up that don't overlap each other. So I think you are stuck with this kind of big sum that you have to compute. Saying that, what's kind of nice is when you do go to take the derivative of this big sum, there's a lot of cancellation. So when you're looking at the density function, just by taking the derivative, you're going to be taking a derivative over this big sum, and there's a lot of calculations. So that's how we can derive at least what the density is. But in general, that would be a hard thing to do. So I'll show you another method that we went in a little bit. So I've taken the derivative right here. So this is just product rule on this first term. This is the derivative of that last term. So we just add them all up. And what we noticed from last time is that these two terms were the ones that canceled. And in general, for the i-th order statistic, all of the terms will cancel except for one of them. Kind of remarkable. So this is just 6 choose 5 times 5. x squared over 4, 2x over 4, and 1 minus x squared over 4. This right here, I'll just remind us, is f of x. This one right here is 1 minus f of x. This one right here is little f of x. And this is what it is. So there's another way to write this. I could write 6 factorial over, well, we'll just write this down, 6 minus 5 factorial, 5 factorial, and there's a 5 right here. So this cancels one of those factorials, and this is 4 factorial. So when our brave soldier came up last time and tried to write this down again, thank you very much, we just missed this one part of everything. So I'm just going to write this down again in general. So this formula that we ended up coming up with, specific to the fifth order statistic, was just 6 factorial over 4 factorial and 6 minus the order statistic factorial. I'm just going to write this down that this is n minus i in general. Let's shoot. Where i in our case is equal to 5. This is the order statistic of interest. This is n minus i factorial. This is i minus 1 factorial. And this is 10 factorial. And then we had f of x. What was this raised to? This is raised I've missed the term, right? So we're all just a touch too sleepy at this point. Four. Four, yes. Four. So this 
right here is i minus 1. 5 minus 1 is 4. f of x. times 1 minus f of x, cap f, and this is n minus i. So that's the formula that we just came up with. And in general, that is the general formula that we write down. This is true in general. And so you could almost come up with a proof of this just through this example. Just be careful, we made it a little bit simple by using 5 and 6, so there are only two terms. If you could generalize that derivative, we would have a proof. It could be done. Let me show you how I actually do this. that I'm drawing is the fundamental theorem of calculus, kind of in disguise. So, or at least parts that go into it. So I want to consider some number line where I've got n things on this number line. with figuring out what the distribution of the ith order statistic is. Now you might say, hey, look, you've already done it. We're finished, but let's come up with another understanding of where this density comes from. So here's the ith largest thing right here. So I'm going to give that a name. That's xi ordered. This one right here is x1. So over here is xn. It's for redundancy. So let me ask a question. How many things are over here? I minus one. I minus one things. Combinatorial okay. expert over here. We'll see how well we can scale this up where the breaking point is. How many things are over here? mathematics and cannot count, <laughs> which is most of my colleagues. So, so this is n minus i things over here. Okay. What's the probability that we're over here? any one of these points, remember they all happened IID. Their IID draws from some distribution by the way I drew it. Looks like my distribution is uniform. Just doing this for visual reasons. So what's the probability of being over here? Do you mean the single draw being? Yes. Uh -huh. Any particular draw. probability of being over here. Well, 
write this one down because you've already answered the question. One minus cap f. Now I'm going to get a little cheeky. So I can't quite ask the question, what's the probability of being here? So we already know the answer to that. It's zero. And so this is the question that Newton was facing. How do we handle this case where there's no explicit area where we limit this thing? And so here's what most of these arguments look like. Is I might want to answer this with some small little window in here. And I'm going to give this window a little bit of width. And I'm going to name that width. I'm going to say this is minus epsilon, and this is plus epsilon. So I have this little epsilon of width right between there. Now I can talk about what the probability of being in this area is. Okay? So I could look at the CDF evaluated here, subtract off the CDF there. So they're off by a couple epsilon. If you wanted to make it one epsilon and look more like a calculus proof, that's fine for me too. But I need to divide by epsilon as well so that I'm scaling it by the area. This was Elisa's question this time. Bless you. Where she's like, don't you have to divide by the, well, if it were probabilities that I were dealing with. And in her case that she was asking the question, we were dividing by one. And so this is the notion of a derivative. And so when I epsilon this thing, I've got some probability, and then I'm going to take the limit of the difference between the probability evaluated here to here, and then I'm going to scale it by two epsilon. And I'm going to take that limit. So, and if you don't want to do that, we can write down what the answer is. What's the instantaneous probability, that instantaneous rate, that thing that's not a probability, but what we're thinking about in this limiting argument? What do we call that? So limit epsilon goes to zero in this, where I've got f of x plus epsilon minus f of x minus epsilon over 2 epsilon right here. So this is that probability we'd be talking about in this thing goes to the density function, calculus 101. So mathematicians are good at buttering up this little proof and writing all these little details. And engineers usually think, and I just like jumping to f of x right there. I know that's the thing that I plug in there. If you understand why, you could probably explain it to somebody with a picture. I think that's good enough for me. And so now let's go back to, however you want to digest this, let's go back to the original question. Why all these little factorial things? So how many different ways can I rearrange all these points? It doesn't matter to me. <coughs> The order in which they came here, I could shuffle them around over here, and it's indistinguishable. And so there's i minus 1 factorial different orderings to this, and I get the same picture. That's all I care about. And so this is i minus 1 factorial ways of rearranging. And similarly, there's n <coughs> minus i factorial ways of rearranging things over here. How many ways are there of rearranging that one point? I'm keeping the picture the same. There's only one choice. So nothing to move around. So we're almost done with the reconstruction of this argument. Almost back to your thing. Different ways of looking at it, either through the derivative or this sort of pseudo-calculus. But what I'll write down, I'll just write it down again. If I try to figure out what the distribution, the density function is for this whole thing, all of these things are conditionally independent. So I just need the product of them together. So I'll do that. 
What's the probability of all of these things happening? Will each one of them happen with this probability right here, f of x? And there's i minus 1 of them. Through independence, I just product them together. So that's just raising it to that power. How many different indistinguishable ways can I order everything there? I think we'll deal with the whole problem at the end, but we have to think about this reordering of everything. But I multiply in my density function, that's that one point, and the stuff to the right of that, that's n minus i. And now I need to take care of all of my rearrangements, so my combinatorics in this problem. The combinatorics are n factorial, different rearrangement of all of these points. You can rearrange them in any way, but some of them, I care about their distinguishability. And so I have to take out my minus one factorial. If you'd like one factorial, I can cut that down, <coughs> n minus i factorial. We usually don't write that down. So that's where they all come from, a different way of looking at it. So kind of cool. So I'd almost call that a proof. Here's how I feel about it. If I were in graduate school, I'd say that's not a proof. I can do better than that. And the details matter. Nowadays, it doesn't really bother me one way or the other. So I think that's proofy enough. So that's our density function for the i order statistic. Just ask a question. Some simple questions. <clears throat> so let's say Xi comes from a uniform zero one. I goes from one to n. All of these are I and What's f of x n? So this is the max. Now you could say, hey, I'm just going to go to my formula, figure out what this thing is. I'll go to that. Well, this only has one term in it. So I could probably figure out what that one term is. That's one way of doing the problem. So I could look at this formula. I, I'll say J is equal to I. I in our case is gonna be N. I'll sum to N. N choose J. Fx to the J, one minus Fx. N minus J. So I could just go and brute force this thing. Say, so let's plug everything in. Well, that's kind of convenient. J is equal to N, so there's only one term in this sum. And so I could write down that this is F X to the N. N choose N, if you will, 1 minus F X to zero. And I could be done with that problem. Cool. It is that. Or I could think about it differently. I could say, let's work out the density function first, and then integrate over it, and see if that works. And if you do it correctly, you'll get the same answer. Or you could think about it entirely differently. I could think about this just very conceptually. I could say, this is the probability that all x's, xi's, are less than x. So what is this asking? This is the probability that the max 
of all of my x's is less than x. That's what the question is. It's exactly the same as asking the question, what's the probability of every single thing being less than x? These are equivalent probability calculations. If the max is less than x, then all of them are less than x. Why? Because they're ordered. So what's the probability of this happening right here? Well, it's the probability of all things being less than x. They're all IID, so it's just that. So I don't like to just write down the formula. I don't like just having a picture to derive a formula. I like thinking about the formula in lots of different ways. So if I use different intuition on how to get an answer, either mechanically by working through this or working through that and doing an integral or coming up with an equivalent probability statement. And the combinatorics here are particularly easy, and this works out real nicely because all of these data points are high ID. So lots of ways to do this sort of problem. So I've asked this question many times on the midterm. So let me just figure this out, and this will be like one of my easier questions. And I'm always astonished people will get it wrong because it doesn't get much easier when you're dealing with order statistics. So if I wanted to work through this formula right here, I just need to come up with this f of x. And if we went through all our excruciating detail and we plugged everything in, I would have the answer. Real quickly, what's the f of x in this case? That's, that would be a correct answer. Let me ask this question. What's the probability that the minimum is less than a particular number? It seems like a particularly simple question like this. It's got a lot of formula. Might not need to use it. off the top of their head? So, so this is the minimum. So my uniform example, zero to one, I've got n data points in here. I'm looking for the distribution of that thing with those around. It's going to be some distribution that's going to be shoved over towards zero as n gets bigger. Um, when you work through the answer, that better happen. So, so I'd like to look for that on midterms as well. Do you see, do you know what a sensible answer looks like? N minus f of x times 1 minus, one minus f. I heard a lot of things that sounded like that. So what is this bit? Let's just write this down, 1 minus, 1 minus f of x. And you can get this from the formula if you'd like. If you'd like, you go to this and just compute this thing. I wouldn't start with the first thing and sum through everything. That'd be a huge tragic error. So you'd have this big sum, the worst sum to work with. And if I had asked what's the density or something like that, and you're trying to remember what the picture looked like, but you didn't, and you said, I'm going to take all these derivatives, that would be a tragic answer. What you'd want to do is flip the problem around and work in the complementary space. And so complement, complement in and out of the problem. And so what is this right here, this inferior part, is just the probability that all of my x's Say x1 is greater than 1, but I know these things are all ordered. So the probability that x1 is greater than x, right here. 
Why is this all true? The definition of what an order stat is. So, and if you'd like me to put the equal signs on here, I'm happy to do that as well. So, if you're in continuous land, it didn't matter, and if you're in discrete land, you just Saying that, I've complemented, usually I like the equal signs on the other side of the problem, just out of tradition. I don't care how you handle it. The answers will come out the same, either way. So that's that. So this is just the probability. All Xi's greater than X. They're all IID. So what's the probability of that happening? It's that. Now I want to flip the direction of the sign again. So I've just flipped this direction. So 1 minus f of x is measuring the probability that something is greater. And then I complement that to put it on a CDF scale. And that's what it is. So you can think about it very traditional. Just what is the probability statement? You can run your formula, either work through the sum answer directly, go through the density, integrate it. They'll all work out the same. I'd encourage you to try that. So problems that you know should work out in these all these different angles, work through them as homework exercises. So this one, if somebody can't write this down and they get this wrong, I get worried on midterms. Okay. Let's see if we got that proof that I did. Let's change the question slightly. Well, let me just ask, did anybody read through the book on the bivariate order statistics? What the formula is for bivariate distribution of order stats? You know? It'd be good if you read the book. <laughs> so, saying that, it's a little complicated what they work through. So read through it. See how you do in that passage. I remember reading through it and going, I will never remember this formula ever. So I have no ability to remember this thing. So I'm going to forget this every other day. I hope they don't ask about it on a test. And of course they're going to. So let's see who remembers it. So I needed to come up with a way of reconstructing this formula. And that's the picture. We'll do that picture again and see if it works out. My doubt is in green. So my, my query is about why do we have the shuffling of the terms less than x? Since they're already ordered. They're IID. So it didn't matter which order they came in. Remember, I'm looking at all permutations of that thing. So I'm looking at all possible ways that, in our example, five things can be less than six. How many different ways are there that can happen? Well, I have to account for all the different orderings that produce the same picture. So that's the rough summary. You'll get another chance right here. We'll say that same thing again, but it is the same reason every single time. I don't care what the order is. So that they came in. Yeah, they're ordered in my picture. That's true. That's true for any data set. But I want to know what's the probability that five things are less than six. There's a lot of ways that can happen in our example. So bivariate order stats. I do want to make this real clear because it's important and true. If you read this book and you understand it, and in four years you get out of here and you have good knowledge of this book, you go on to get a professorship. You can teach this class. Nobody wants to teach this class. So because you have to know how to do all the problems. And so and that's a little bit of work. It's job security. And it also gives you a better understanding of all the different branches of inference. So when you go to colloquium, you can go, no, I, I understand how these fields relate to each other. So just because I'm not a Bayesian per se doesn't mean I don't understand your Bayesian argument. And I have a different way of thinking about that problem as well. And so you go on to a claim of success if you know this book. If there's any book in your first two years, if you want to be a statistician, this is it. Know this book. So this is the whole thing. This is the threshold book. 
This will define your career. How'd I do? You guys gonna read the mm -hmm. Try it. Skim it at least. Keep going back to it. Bring in my book next time I'll show it to you again. So this book looks way too fresh right now. So I'll hold it. So could this proof that we just did, can we use it to show consistency of the sample minimum as an estimator of the person? You'd be able to do those sort of things. Absolutely. So look at that distribution, maximize it, see what happens as n goes, and we'd be able to show how it scrunches. So yeah, we would be able to do all those groups. So, and we'll get to some of them. So right now we're just working with the distributions. We haven't said what we'll use as estimators, but we're going to use these distributions as our foundations for estimators, and we'll show all those properties. OK, bivariate order statistics. So I want f of x i and x j. And I'll call this u and v. Uh, hold on. Let me think very carefully real quick. match your thing. What I'm trying to avoid is saying F U. So you're going to get it anyway. And so this is the i order statistic. J order stat, obviously. I'm going to put the order in here. I'm going to be explicit about this. X J is greater than or equal to xi. And I'll point out to you that if you study all the formula that we just came up with, and I'd encourage you to do this, pies are never an issue in those formulas. Pies are handled. So long as if you have a tie, say you've got three things and the two first things are equal to each other, that would be x1 and x2 with the braces. So as long as you count the redundancy. So I'll just put an order on this and say I know which one is bigger. And this is the actual point in the space. This is point in space where x lives. So these are my points in space right here. These are my random variables, just to give ourselves some notation. If I had a lot of bold facing, I might make those bold and dark and use the same notation right here and make those italics, something like that. So fairly arbitrary dummy variables. We want to know what this thing is. So it's a joint distribution of both of these. Now, we've already seen and talked about and in two, two would have late come up with these two things are not independent of each other. So I can't just take the marginals, those order statistics, and product them together. I needed everything to sort through, so obviously there's some dependence. And we'll see that after we derive this. And we probably want the density as well. The density, f, x, i, x, j. I'll use the same notation. Okay. This one's going to be this big, nasty combinatorial thing with lots of terms in the sum. We can start there like I did last time, but I'm going to switch my order of all of this. And I'm going to work through the density. And if I can write down the density, then I can go backwards with calculus and get this formula. And so if I ask you about something on the test, I'm probably going to ask you about this formula. Let's work through this one. So let me draw a picture of what I'm talking about. So we've got n data points. So n things. So J 
just to be pedantic, how many different rearrangements of these end things do I have? Permutations and factorial. There's some of them that I want to distinguish from each other. That's why we divide things out in the other factorials that we'll see up here right here. So let's let this be u, this be d, this is x i, that data point, and this is x j. So I'm letting those be part of my n data points as well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, draw these little epsilon balls around everything, and then I'm going to limit those probabilities to come up with some definition of a density. And so what's the probability that stuff happens over here? I'll do it backwards this time. Prob of a data point being over here. F of U. F of U. So, and this is for that random variable X that I'm not writing, writing down very often. I'll just be specific about it. Since I've got multiple Fs running around. How many of these things do we have? One. Oh, oh no, um, to the left we have I, um, I minus one. I minus one. How many different rearrangements do I have of all these things? I minus one factorial. I minus one factorial. So I'm going to pull those out of the combinations. So again, it is this counting argument. How many things to the left and to the right of everything? So there's one thing here. How many things are over here? N minus J. N minus J. And there's N minus J factorial rearrangements of everything that we're going to have to account for. How many things are in here? G minus I minus 1, I think. J minus I minus 1. Absolutely correct. There's J <coughs> up to there. So how many things would be in this whole thing, J minus I, but we have to subtract out that one as well. That's the 9 o'clock, can you count exercise? Fold up then. then you know, so how many different rearrangements? It's those. There's one thing here. To get this correct, you need all of these things that we're counting up to add to N. So you can double check your own work. So it's really just an exercise in counting. What's the probability of being over here? So that would be um, 1 minus f of v. 1 minus f v. That's right. And what's the probability of being in here? f v minus f of f again, it's just cap x. v minus f of u. This probability, this density is just this. I'll write in all my combinatorics in a moment. I'm going to have a whole bunch of different terms. So I've got f of x, f for random variable x, u, raised to the i minus 1. Then I have f evaluated right here at u. I don't know if I've written these in right here. Yeah. These are just f, v, and this one is little f, u. Just to be specific, that's for my IID random variable, that density function. It's only one of those. So, F for 
time and variable x, v minus f x u raised to the j minus i minus 1. This is multiplication. So I'm just continuing this expression. So multiply times this f x v. Only one of those. One minus f the random variable x. It's all the same. Evaluated at b, and we raise that to the n minus j. So that's the probability of those. Now, this question that we keep getting how many rearrangements? This is just, we're kind of doing a probability calculation and taking the limit. So, this is just a basic combinatorial problem. What's the probability that I have things over here? There's i minus 1 ways of rearranging it, and I still have i minus 1 way things over there. That's all we're adding up. And so i minus 1 factorial, divide those out. I can put in 1 factorial, but I'll repress that. This is j minus i minus 1 factorial and n minus j factorial. There's our density function, our joint density. It's not just a glorified multinomial distribution. It's different. So this is not a multinomial coefficient. I'm taking two of the points out. I thought that would just be the one factor on the one. You can, yeah. So you could think of it that way. It's not a probability, but certainly there's a connection looks and feels like that. So that's what we just built up in our discrete land, took the limit of it, and um, we got that. So before we took the limit, it's a multi-node. Once we take the limit, it's anything but. Right. Make sense? Cool. So pretty cool. I'm pretty notorious for asking on midterm one, what's the joint distribution of three order statistics? The subscripts i, j, and k, where those are ordered, as you would think. And if you can draw the picture, problem is 25 free points. And write this thing down. What's the hardest bit? Counting the stuff in the middle. And so I almost get nobody with that question because everybody just practices this a couple times. You can always do it. So the cumulative distribution is a bit complicated. Which margin are you summing over? How are you summing over it? All those typical questions. But you can work through and integrate over this if you want to and do calculus on it. So any questions about this? Okay, good. So um, play around with homework problems that concern this. Next time we're going to be starting the delta method. So read through that. There's an explanation in the book of a multivariate Taylor series. So if I have a vector, how do I create a Taylor series, that vector? So please read through that so we can go through the calculus lesson real quickly. And then we're going to get into delta method, which is a Taylor approximation asymptotic method. We're going to study that for a while. Thanks, sure you guys. Tomorrow we'll do review. And I will send you where we'll do it because I don't want to get down to that.
I know you're the one that is so I gave up earlier, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> see you later. Yeah, see you later. Physics was fun, but. It is. It is.